thank you so much, Lisa. I don't know what more I have to say than what you so admirably summed up, or whether I could even do as good a job in summing it up as, as you just did. Uh, I should get a copy of that. <laughs> uh, thank you all for coming. I'm honored that you wanted to come out and, and listen to this. I am, by training, a political and legal philosopher who studied with major figures of mid-20th century liberalism, including Isaiah Berlin, John Rawls, Michael Walzer, and Robert Nozick. Now, after 40 years of teaching and writing on anti-liberal thinkers, such as Marx, I've come to understand that my job all along has been to put the option of justice, by which I mean historical justice, back on the table of both academic political economy and insurgent political practice. I say back, for I have concluded over the years that the ideological effect of the most influential philosophical and legal thought since the 1970s has been to remove it. So I'll be attempting in this paper to restate the idea of historical justice and to restate it as a project for our day inside the techniques of wealth preservation as they now operate and control our financialized mode of capitalism. My reconceptualization of justice will go against the grain of both liberal and neoliberal ways of thinking about this subject, and is in my view a continuation of the Marxian way of thinking. But by Marxian thinking, I here mean the modern secular project of integrating economics and politics to realize both justice and abundance in a way that redeems or harvests value from the injustices of the past, rather than merely letting go and moving on. Like most Marxists, I am thus especially interested in the economic and social gaps attributable to these past injustices, especially those that tend to increase over time and not those that tend to fade away and eventually disappear. And like almost all Marxists, I refuse to be distracted from historical justice by the abstract argument that there may be some persistent inequalities that do not have unjust origins. I think that today's mainstream discourse analyzing how the world of finance aligns with justice in its main effect is to refuse the original Marxian project of realizing historical justice. This refusal is of course explicit, explicit in neoliberalism's rejection of the welfare state and rejection of the planned economy. But I'll contend today that it was already implicit in mid 20th century liberalism's separation of justice itself from the problem of funding justice. My immediate task is to show that it is conceptually possible to recover the project of historical justice from inside the logic of financial capitalism as it bears on the intertemporal valuing of options that may or may not be exercisable in the future. This recovery, I hope, will create a space in which finance as it now exists can be historically revalued and potentially redirected to fund the project of greater social and economic justice, so that pursuing that project in the presence is always, and always unavoidably, both urgent and affordable. Ultimately, the question I hope this paper's restatement of justice will persuade you to consider is the following one. Shouldn't socialism be a coordinated response to our present, a response at the level of policy, at the level of creative communities, at the level of social movements, a response that uses the techniques of finance to subvert and reverse finance's own tendency to widen the cumulative effects of past injustice. <laughs>
I here see economic justice through the lens of Marx as a problem of accumulation. But I also see it through the lens of finance as a problem of optionality. It is because the economic gaps attributable to past injustice often widen, but could also diminish, that the option of settling historical claims later has a value now. A value now, even if that option of final settlement can't be exercised now. In stressing that justice is an option on the cumulative gains accruing to the historical beneficiaries of past injustice, I distinguish my view from the argument that justice now, historical justice, is an historical debt that has not yet been paid to past victims. And I rather direct attention to the ongoing economic disparities that fluctuate over time rather than, as do most reparation theorists, the mere passage of time that would be used to calculate the exponential growth of unpaid debt according to the miracle of compound interest. To set all this up for you as an academic audience, let me crudely state the academic side of my argument. I am contending that a Marxian materialist and directional politics of historicized justice has been taken off the table of contemporary politics beginning in 1973, when, as it happens, the epistemological breakthrough of financialization, marked by the publication of the Black Scholes and Merton papers, first occurred. These papers provided a recipe, a technology, for both manufacturing and pricing options. And I am arguing that to put justice back on the table of political economy today, it will be necessary to conceptualize justice in the register that the theory of options valuation provides, recognizing that this theory is all about attaching a present value to rolling over claims that are likely to fluctuate in value over time, depending on levels of inequality, instability, and illegitimacy in the social and political system. This argument is an extension and a reconsideration of my previous book, so well described by Lisa, After Evil, which was a critique of what I called the human rights discourse which I treated as an aspect of the global triumph of financialized capitalism. There I analyzed the functioning of human rights today, not as a revolutionary claim for social transformation through popular democracy, but rather as an ideological framework for a very unequal compromise through which the beneficiaries of past historical injustice were allowed to keep the accumulative gains from it by acknowledging the evils of the past and at the same time imposing a political consensus that the continuing and compounding advantages from that earlier time would not be seen as a perpetuation of those evils. This, I argue, is was the humanitarian compromise that allows the self-described post-conflict society to move on by saying that now is never the time for justice, that it will always be too soon until it is too late. The humanitarian deal, put bluntly, is that the beneficiaries of past injustice get to keep their gains in return for granting the victims of historical justice a moral victory. That victory, quite simply, the achievement of a moral consensus that the past really was evil implies a demonization, a marginalization, sometimes even a criminalization of those who continue to think that the struggle continues. But it also requires a presumed political consensus that the evil is past and that anyone who sees its present beneficiaries as continuers of it are guilty of dredging up the past and reviving historical animosities that tend to impede future progress. 
So the political point of transitional justice, as my friend and colleague Randy Martin used to say, is that we're never the right people for justice, and it's never the right time, and usually both are true. My argument in After Evil is that both distributive and reparative historical justice has been effectively disarmed as a political project by being assimilated to the topic that we now call transitional justice, which deals with what levels of unjustified equality, if any, should be allowed to interfere with the flourishing of markets in the present. To the extent that this argument, indeed this focus on maybe unjustified equality even should be allowed to ride, <laughs> takes hold, justice becomes politically optional in the colloquial sense of losing all urgency, of not being necessary. It gets replaced by the idea of non-directional and permanent transitional states in which ongoing beneficiaries of past injustice are off the hook for the after effects of historical evil without even having to defend or justify how they stand in relation to it. By means of human rights discourse, then, beneficiaries get to keep their gains while repudiating the bad history that produced those gains. And this occurs despite overwhelming evidence that the after effects of these histories are cumulative in the straightforward sense that economic and social gaps attributable to those injustices persist and widen. While writing after evil, however, I came to realize that the late 20th century development of transitional justice, which goes along with neoliberalism, is not the whole story. Long before the fall of communism, most of my peers, my classmates in the liberal economy, liked to profess confusion about the very possibility of historically driven claims to justice pursued over a longer term. Even orthodox Marxists, with the notable exception of Poga, typically argue that historical justice involves transferring resources from people who did nothing wrong to people who suffered nothing wrong, which they say comes closer to being a paradigm of injustice than a program for justice. As an ethical and practical matter, then, the distributive justice envisioned by Rawls tends to await the supersession of historical grievances and animosities, if only because it will not then appear to be improperly retributive rather than impartially distributive. So liberalism itself, even prior to its ne neoliberal deformation, the liberalism we all liked, would seem to deny the conceptual justification for large-scale historical redress and would also seem to have lacked any financial or institutional tools for bringing about such redress. Now, the guiding question of my next book, tentatively titled Just Optionality, or Just Optionality, maybe, is whether thinking about justice in the register of financialization, in the register of preserving value, can provide keys to understanding the redistributive project, the thinking about it in the register of producing value of production did not. That it could provide a conceptual basis for historical redress that would necessarily and at the same time involve figuring out how to fund it, figuring out where the money actually is. My argument begins with Randy Martin's early insight that financialization has become an organizing metaphor and worldview for describing our present way of life in much the way that commodification once was. And here uh, we can simply uh, acknowledge the work of our colleague Moish Pustone, who explains so well how commodification worked. I'm trying to say something similar about financialization today. I'm trying to say that optionality, the hedging of one's life portfolio by making better choices, now functions even from below as a category through which financialized subjects, as distinct from merely commodified subjects, negotiate the relation between increasingly unwaged labor, 
and the marketing of consumer products that both substantiate and presuppose one's own creditworthiness in purchasing them. In other words, purchasing them can actually establish the creditworthiness of the purchaser. There is thus a tendency, as some recent commentators said, for finance to penetrate and subsume economic activity and social life as a whole in its voracious quest to permeate even non-financial domains, domains which it can then data mine to create new financial products. Financialization, as I am treating it then, is a totalizing point of view of the present from the standpoint, not of Foucault's homo economicus, the owner of himself, but from the standpoint of an investor in many possible selves, many alternative selves, for whom capital, as an abstraction, is never not invested even when it is held in the form of money. The question from a financialization point of view is always what to fund if one is to forego the liquidity of money. And the answer depends on how highly one values the option of liquidity, the right to invest later, as compared to all of the options available for investing now. So from an investor standpoint, it is always necessary that all asset classes be compared with money and thus valued in terms of the options that can be derived from them then. And then, of course, how easily those options can be monetized or turned back into money. Now, the financial theorist, Emmanuel Derman, who's one of my co-authors in the new book that we're producing on this point of view, a collective volume, expresses the value of optionality in that book by saying that time and the right to choose are worth money. That is, that they can be expressed quantitatively in terms of an amount of money, which is the price of the option that gives you time and the right to choose. I read Derman's point as an explanation of of the paradoxical way in which Marx states his general formula for capital. In capitalism, Marx says, you can make money by investing money, M, C, M prime, where M prime is greater than M. I don't need to write that on the board, I don't think. The implicit paradox, according to Marx, is that you can't explain the systematic growth of surplus value which is reflected, expressed in the value of asset markets, as an expansion of the opportunity to buy and sell the same commodity, C, at two different prices, M and M1, where M1 is higher. But Derman's point is that in the absence of arbitrage, even then, surplus value can be created through the formal exchange of commodities only if a byproduct is greater optionality and greater optionality in a way that is liquid, namely the creation of more time in which there will also be an expanded right to choose that you can cash out at any given moment in the meanwhile or roll over at any future date. An approach to justice then which is based on optionality the value of having more time in which to choose would constitute a significant departure from the liberal philosophies of my teachers. My postgraduate supervisors, Isaiah Berlin and Michael Walzer, taught me to think of distributive justice as a problem of achieving the right relationship between equality and liberty. Equality and liberty, they insisted, were to be seen as separate social goods that were also potentially in conflict because greater inequality could result from greater liberty, a point that they thought Marx exaggerated, but which was nevertheless true. The good thing we learned from them was that this conflict was possible but not inevitable. To state this lesson in the language of optionality, 
we can now say that equality is a matter of spreads between economic positions, the relative gaps between ranks in a ranked hierarchy, and that these spreads could arguably diminish with greater overall growth as they did during the great convergence of the mid-20th century described by Simon Kuznets. The question of distributive justice at mid-century was thus whether to constrain liberty and its potential to produce greater economic growth in circumstances when that growth did not produce a greater convergence in the gaps between ranks. Now this was the question that was directly addressed in the debate between John Rawls and Bob Nozick, whose major books on justice emerged while I was in their classes. They both assumed that economic disparities were in fact diminishing as a result of growing GDP. The question for them was whether all were entitled to benefit maximally from further economic growth as though it would be considered a collective product. And the most important issue dividing them was why spreads or inequalities would matter at all unless they were the outcome of wrongful acts. That is to say, illegitimate choices made at the expense of others. And this whole moment, of course, in intellectual history is a sublimation of the problem of Brown versus Board of Education. The question is whether what's wrong with racial discrimination is that it produces widening inequalities, or whether the only thing wrong with widening inequalities is that sometimes it might result from wrongful acts of racial discrimination. So this whole, this whole philosophy is really, is really the, the mid-century moment, which was, I think, the high point of, uh, of American pursuit of social justice. But for all, you see, the only spread that mattered, especially from the standpoint of Distributive justice was what we might call the outside spread between the best off and the worst off in positions that were a ranked hierarchy. Why? Because from the point of view of judging the justice of basic institutions, it didn't matter which individuals occupied which ranks. So the magnitude of all of the inside spreads could be like an accordion that would widen or narrow uh, oh, and, and with the, where the justification of that widening or narrowing uh, would be to m minimize the magnitude of, of the outside spread. Now, Nozick did not see why people in the middle who had done nothing wrong should have a different pattern of social and economic relations imposed upon them for the benefit of the poorest, whose positional improvement would not and should not necessarily be funded by the richest alone or even by the richest at all, provided that the poorest could be made off by any rearrangement of society made as well off as they could possibly be. Nozick's question was put in the form of the following. Problem. Why should nomads, and we might now consider them pastoralist nomads or Delusian nomads, or any nomads you like, he just called them nomads. Why should nomads who traverse a hierarchically ranked social structure at the lowest income level without affecting those above potentially trigger a just rearrangement of all other income spreads solely for the purpose of making the nomads better off? And why should those passing through, whether you regard this in terms of weeks, or months, or generations, or merely in terms of immigration, or refugee status? Why should those passing through at any intermediate point in between the best off and the worst off positions have no legitimate redistributive effects on the relative gaps between other ranks in the income hierarchy? <clears throat> According to Nozick's argument, nomads defined as those with no causal effect on the rest of the structure, should have no claims to justice based on purely structural inequalities, nor should they be entitled to make demands that present patterns of distribution be disturbed for their benefit. And this is directly relevant to a lot of the refugee and immigration issues 
that we have today, for example, Syrians in Europe. His stated point was that distributive justice should be based on causal, or in this case, historical arguments that something wrong was done and not on the pattern of social outcomes. And he argued that unjust enrichment from wrongdoing, whether, the, whether by the richest or not, should be entirely disgorged, regardless of its effect on social structure. So although Nozick's Anarchy State and Utopia was published in the same year, 1973, as the Black Shoals formula, it's instructive to recast Nozick's critique of roles in the language of options and then try to state it more dynamically. Rawlsian injustice, as Nozick saw it, could be seen as the option to upset the existing social structure to bring about what I'll later call an event of disaccumulation, an illiquidity event, viewed simply and statically as the magnitude of the gaps between ranks. All of them can be upset in order to accordion in the top and the bottom. That option may be based on historical grievance, but it would be puttable, or I would say exercisable, at a revolutionary moment, or so it might have seemed before option theories took hold and made it possible to price that option at every moment. In other words, to attach a present value to future contingencies. Since 1973, we have come to understand that as an option, justice can have value even when it can't be exercised, and that the present value of justice as an option would depend upon viewing the social structure, the entire social structure, dynamically and as a whole, so that the gaps between ranking and the rank orderings themselves would both be in play. What then, we might ask, are the rates of change in the spreads between any pair of spreads? And what are the relevant rates of change among the pairs? And how rapidly are the gaps between the ranks narrowing or widening? Is crossing the same gap worth a jump of, say, two ranks at one part of the structure, but not at another? I wrote a critique of the MOOCs and the ways in which the MOOCs are being marketed in third world as out-of-the-money options, for example, to transfer to Berkeley from a community college in California as an opportunity to cross many ranks with one gap and so on and so forth. They're options. They're out-of-the-money options. They're unexercisable opportunities to attend Berkeley. From the option is of value whether or not there is the opportunity, in other words. It's important important. From this perspective, the value of rolling over the option of just disaccumulation or bringing about a legitimate disgorgement of unjust enrichment from past injustice would vary with the volatility of volatility, which is itself a function of how much uncertainty there is about whether future risks would be like those of the past or whether something new will at some point be seen to have happened. Now, when I try to work at a philosophical level resembling that of my teachers, my project is quite simply to restate the question of justice, not as a tension between equality and liberty, but rather in terms of optionality, which is a theory of value, a theory of valuation in a dynamic situation, in a dynamic setting. This is to combine equality and liberty as social goods within a single historicized frame for understanding the question of social valuation as such. The core idea is that we no longer need to speak of a conflict between equality spreads and liberty choices. We can now rather speak in financial terms about how choice itself has greater time value when volatilities are increasing, and why rolling over an option is a way of harvesting present value 
from future changes in the volatility of those spreads. For example, under certain circumstances, the value of exercising one's option to bring about a disgorgement of wealth might be higher than in other circumstances. For example, moments of transitional justice, as I described earlier. So following Derman, I claim that the value of having more time in which to exercise the right to choose is most precisely described as having an option to choose at a later time when the spreads will be greater or smaller. Okay. How highly, then, we value rolling over a choice or optionality today will depend upon how well that rollover hedges us against changes in the volatility of social gaps and not merely how well it hedges us on the expected return of occupying a particular position as owners of financial instruments or people who have a particular type of professional skill or training. Here we can easily see how the language of finance supersedes that of free market libertarianism, of Foucault's Homo Economicus, of Gary Becker's Human Capital, which is the self-ownership of a certain type of skill, because it's a form of portfolio theory in which the value of choice is assumed and the particular composition or portfolio of attributes is changeable. This, I think, marks the difference between the neoliberal moment anticipated in Foucault's 1973 lectures on biopolitics and the financialized moment today, which now extends, as I've said, beyond the financial sector to the production of commodities and even also to the production of the self. So the aim of my post-Rawlsian, post-Marxian approach to social justice is to restore it as a political option in the ordinary sense of the word by allowing actors in the present to redefine it as a contingent claim on the accumulated wealth of society. To regard it as an option not merely in the ordinary sense, but also in the financial sense, and also, of course, in the concrete sense that it is an expression of the power implicit in democracy, about which I'll say more later in the talk. It is only when justice is a live option within democracy, I think, that democracy itself is distinguishable from a political technology for merely manufacturing consent to the status quo. So unlike liberalism's framing of the question of justice in our time, my approach is not reducible to regarding historical justice as a final settlement or liquidation of claims on the cumulative benefit of past injustice. Rather, I see these cumulative benefits as the result of not having settled historical claims for their liquidation value, and instead of having allowed the cumulative benefits of past injustice to continue to run. Okay. These benefits, I think, are a collective product, but not in Rawls's sense of being the product of an agreement of how to distribute the benefits produced by deviating from strict equality going forward in order to have heightened productivity. They are rather the result of a non-revolutionary peace in which the question of disgorgement by beneficiaries has been indefinitely postponed while remaining an option. An option. The fact that justice is optional then, in the ordinary sense, simply means that its value as an asset in the financial sense even when historical, especially when historical settlement would question, would threaten liquidity, would threaten massive disaccumulation, is important. The optionality of justice, I am arguing, and this would be the 
topic of another paper in political economy, political sociology. But the optionality of justice is thus an essential feature of capitalist democracies, which can make people pay a political price to preserve the value of accumulated wealth, especially in eras like this one, when that wealth itself is increasingly held in the form of financial options or derivatives. It follows, at least for me, that the question of historical justice, which was once the revolutionary project, can be reanimated for our present by focusing attention on the social technical machinery by which wealth is preserved and accumulated. Are the ongoing and increasing benefits of past injustice being held somewhere, at least virtually, in a fund? I lectured on this in relation to the peace process in Bogota uh, twice this year, where the question is where the, where, where the money for the war is and who is going to benefit from the peace and where that money is. And of course, both sides. There's a fund. The option of justice should not be taken off the table as part of the transition, is what I argued, and people seem to hear that. Now, if this is the case, then those benefits of past injustice can be redescribed and possibly repurposed in a way that expresses the present value of justice as an option that is worth something, even when it can't be exercised. And we can begin, and this is again the topic of another paper, to do this by talking about relative payoff knockouts and knock-ins within various bands of return so that you can describe social programs funded by a combination of public and private debt as uh, in the way that uh, so-called exotic options are described. Raising such possibilities, which I like to do as a, uh, as a union president in 17 years of doing that at the University of California, is my way of reopening the question of historical justice by suggesting that today, historical justice is the name of the social and political question that is made available to us by the technologies of finance, which are the technologies that allow large-scale transfers of wealth to occur without necessarily diminishing asset values through the assignability of collateral and the redirection of flows of funds. To move toward justice is thus simply a critical confrontation with how the preservation and compounding of injustice is financed. Why isn't the problem of justice itself then a matter of addressing why it isn't yet being financed and how it could be? I'm here advocating an approach to justice that makes the problem of funding it intrinsic rather than extrinsic. It's no longer, you know, well, that's justice, but then the question is what we can afford, and here we have an argument for postponement or delay in which justice itself isn't really an option because we can't afford it, you see? That's the view I'm arguing against. If historical justice is to be a serious goal in the era of finance, it cannot remain merely an abstract ideal of greater justice that, of course, the society itself cannot afford. This insight led me to expand the critical view of transitional justice that I developed in After Evil, because I now want to describe justice itself as an option on the cumulative value of past injustice. This option, in my sense, would be defined as the right but not the obligation to impose a gain-based remedy against the ongoing beneficiaries of past injustice. Viewing justice as an option on accumulated gains and not as a reparation or compensation for past harms avoids the problem that preoccupies my philosophical contemporaries of imposing a loss-based remedy against people who are not direct perpetrators and who do not deserve to be punished for the benefit of uh, people who are not themselves victims. 
It avoids, as I say in After Evil, seeing reparations as an unpaid debt that compounds in value as a square of time. My view rather is that justice is an option that fluctuates in value as a square of volatility, which is simply a description of what the Black-Scholes formula says. In After Evil, then, I explored the question of what happens, as Lisa said, if putting injustice in the past does not coincide with the beginning of justice, what comes in between. Using the perspective I've gained since then from studying finance, I believe that the accumulation of present asset value in relation to historical justice is best expressed in two ways. One, it is the result of not having exercised the option of justice at the moment of putting injustice in the past. And two, it is the result of still preserving the option of justice to come as a basis for politics in the meanwhile. Hence the subtitle of my paper is Justice and Option, Politics After Evil. Getting to politics, then, let me try to expand on the political idea behind my concept of historical justice as an option on the accumulated value of past injustice. Suppose you think of the beneficiary problem I posed in After Evil, not as a matter of compensating historical victims for their losses, but as a matter of what political gains continue to accrue and increase as a result of injustices that are now disavowed rather than defended. And suppose further that you think of the historical injustice itself as a social process of continuing to produce wealth, the accumulation of which depends entirely on its continuing liquidity in financial markets. It would follow, then, that a liquidity crisis defined as an event of disaccumulation, if there's no market for capital assets, you write down their value to zero. An event of disaccumulation can be brought about by any collective action that threatens either the valuation or repossession of the collateral through which financial assets can be turned into actual money at something close to their present market value. This kind of threat can occur, as we saw in 2008, through refusal on the part of financial actors to trade an asset until it is recollateralized, which of course amounts to a huge transfer of the underlying wealth, the liquidation value of that asset. It might also occur, as we saw in 2011, in the anti-Wall Street protests with which I was involved, by physically occupying assets that financial markets could otherwise assume to be repossessable through the technologies that are used to net out asset, vision, uh, asset positions at the end of a trading day without any physical transfers occurring. Those capitalist operations simply cannot occur unless people are willing to vouch for the fact that the collateral can be repossessed even though that collateral is literally physically very often in our hands. It is our debt. It is the money we owe, which is the asset or collateral for a lot of these financial products. Now, if we make these suppositions, then it's possible to think of Wall Street financiers in the same register as capital terror, capitalist terrorists who used the choke point of liquidity to extract whatever price there was to be paid for allowing the cumulative gains of past injustice to run. And we now know how large that price turned out to me. A more general point, however, is that the price extracted is and was politically imposed and came at the expense of lowering the value of the options available to people on the downside of rising gaps in income and wealth. The alternative, as they were told, and as the Greeks were again told last summer, 
would be massive disaccumulation, a massive writing down of the value of the wealth resulting from past injustice, leaving that whole bad history with no positive result. The option of historical justice is truly off the table then, if what we assume in times of crisis is that in the end, the positive result of all that bad history must be allowed to ride, no matter who benefits from it. The option of historical justice is off the table if we do not regard those benefits as a fund or constructive trust in which it is not the case that the beneficiaries of past injustice can seize what I'm going to call the entire liquidity premium necessary to keep their asset valuations intact. When I speak in this paper of the financial institutions that collected the liquidity premium in 2008-2009, and I'll tell you how big it was in a moment, I mean to evoke the possibility, the political possibility, that a similar event could be generated by sabotage or terrorist attack and also by political action. Indeed, the financial markets would not have recovered in 2009-2010 if investors did not believe that the U.S. government can already secure the capital markets from terrorist attack and sabotage by means of collecting metadata on ordinary financial transactions so that unusual patterns can be identified and so that the government can decide on the fly how to distinguish between the kind of crash we're going to let happen because it's the result of ordinary capitalist greed and the kind of crash we're going to stop because it's the result of an event that shows the market can be and has been hacked by malicious actors. The problem, of course, is that we wouldn't have a market if we did not trust the government now to be able to make those decisions, and it wouldn't be a market if we believed that the government could openly decide when to stop a crash and when to allow it to occur. Why then, for example, if the government can do this, couldn't the market itself be hacked or regulated or socialized? How can we continue to say, as Hayek said, that the market is the best computer because there is no better metadata on what's going on if the existence of the market now depends upon our knowing and not knowing that the metadata exists, in some sense. What this means, of course, is that political movements that bring about an illiquidity event will always be accused of sabotage and be subject to anti-terrorist controls. But this is so in much the way that strikers were treated as industrial saboteurs in the 19th and 20th centuries. This is why it is important not only to understand how the sabotage can occur, but also, as strikers did, to be able to cast the issue as an issue of putting the option of justice back on the table rather than simply creating a terrorist threat. Now, once we understand the perpetuation of injustice from within the categories of finance, it should be possible to conceive of popular actions that pull or move the levers or operations of financial accumulation. The terrorist sab suicide bombers on Wall Street, in a sense, showed us the way. And we could potentially use this strategy and power to develop long and short-range approaches to raise the present value of justice considered as an option we could do this in a way that would be analogous for our time to the ways in which disruptions of agrarian and industrial forms of capitalist exploitation could have been expressions or rollovers of the option to collectivize <coughs> land and to nationalize factories. Isn't the objective of political struggle to somehow make the producers of vehicles of capital accumulation pay more to keep what they have. And doesn't Marxism become more fully itself when capital formation as such, rather than merely its industrial form, 
when capital formation as such becomes the site of class struggle. The moment for such political struggle arrives only when we say that justice is an option and that there has to be a higher price extracted to keep markets liquid as volatility both political and economic increases. How large that price is and who gets paid that price are of course the questions that must be resolved by political struggle, not by abstract financial theory, which can tell us only what the price might have been as implied by various applications of what Naomi Klein calls the shock doctrine in the past. Financial theory teaches further that the answers to the question of who gets paid do not necessarily affect the asset valuations themselves and that any negative effects on aggregate accumulation result in applying external and most typically political force to bring on an illiquidity event and then to extract a premium for resolving it. An important lesson learned in 2008 is that liquidity comes at a price and that price is the political cost of preserving the value of financial assets at a moment when justice as an option is rising in value. This political cost can be further raised by movements such as Occupy, Strike Death, Red Debt, I should say, Syriza, Podemos, and so forth. So one question is simply how large the politically driven cost of reestablishing liquidity can be, from which follow further questions about who pays and who appropriates that cost and in what form. The question of how large, and I'm going to skip a little bit here, is of course something that can fluctuate enormously. At the low end, the amount is simply the spread claimed by dealers in the repo market, which is the way in which the financial market gets funded through establishing a price for making collateral liquid. The high end, it can be as large as the guarantee put up by the U.S. government to overwrite global debt markets. The U.S. government pledged $13 trillion, which is the size of our entire tax base at the time, and it actually swapped 5 to $7 trillion of government debt for toxic collateral that was supposed to be synthetically equivalent to U.S. Treasuries and that was made synthetically equivalent uh, only because the government was willing to swap it. Now, in this way, I would argue that the U.S. government acted as what the monetary economist Perry Merlin calls a dealer of last resort, effectively underwriting private credit, the value of private debt with public credit, so that global financial markets, especially in derivatives, could continue to be funded. Ironically, the result was to make the U.S. government more beholden to the very bond markets it was trying to regu and regulate and rescue because, in effect, the U.S. government was borrowing from those markets while at the same time agreeing not to spend the funds it borrowed in return for being able to borrow at zero interest so that it could manufacture safe collateral uh, and so on and so forth. The time, the reason for this was that the U.S. government was under no political pressure from an organized and militant left, which I'm kind of trying to uh, incite, uh, but which had no idea that there was an implied premium of 5 to $13 trillion that was being used to underwrite a total credit market debt of about $76 trillion, which using... Uh, Piketty's metric of measuring the relationship of, 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 of wealth to production was about five to eight times GDP. In other words, the question of how large the liquidity premium is is re directly related, of course, to the question of who gets paid. And who gets paid were, at this point, the suicide bombers on Wall Street and at other financial sectors who extracted a ransom for not blowing themselves up along with the entire financial system. They got to act as though they were simply exercising the put that they received for free because of their systemic importance to global orders in which capital markets are fully funded by money markets 
that are collateralized by high quality public debt. Now, the culminating insight, and here I'm moving toward a conclusion, the culminating insight of my five-year collaborative project out of Santa Cruz called Rethinking Capitalism is very simple. It is that the Black Scholes Merton model for pricing derivatives has a central and unnoticed implication. If you rebalance the formula, simple algebra, which is all I can do, if you rebalance the formula, you can see that it is a technology for commensurating public and private debt. It is a technology, in other words, essentially for producing synthetic public debt, risk-free debt, that for purposes of collateralization, for purposes of underwriting the values of financial markets, functions in exactly the same way as risk-free public debt. In other words, it is the privatization of the process of issuing public debt through private financial institutions. It can be rewritten as an equation commensurating all asset prices with U.S. Treasuries and showing what assets would be worth if their identifiable risk components were stripped out and a synthetically risk-free asset were produced. What we learned in 2008 is that this formula actually is about the relationship of public and private debt. This is, this is in a sense, the critique and supersession, supersession of neoliberalism. And we learned that when these synthetic treasuries become illiquid, when they become worth less than government obligations, their theoretical equivalence to government obligations has to be performed by swapping them for real U.S. treasuries at par in whatever quantities are necessary to stabilize financial markets, to stabilize financial markets by providing the money markets with a replenished supply of safe collateral. On paper, then, the bailout consisted of government getting to borrow for free from the financial sector on condition that government would not spend the additional funds that it raised and that this was a necessary, and that it raised simply as a necessary side effect of substituting public borrowing for synthetic public debt produced by private borrowing. Since then, there has been no doubt that asset market liquidity in a larger sense, namely the question of whether there will even be a market, is ultimately guaranteed by the government's willingness to step in and trade its own debt backed by currency that it can also print for privately issued debt that would otherwise be illiquid, provided only that it doesn't spend the currency that it raises. My claim today is that this swap has both theoretical and political significance. Politically, it means that the capitalist state no longer borrows more in order to spend more, as it did in Keynesian versions of capitalism. In austerity capitalism, the state rather spends less so that it can borrow more cheaply. A correlative definition of austerity is simply that this is the case only because the option of justice is taken on the table at precisely the moment when it should command a higher premium for a rollover and when the premium itself can be paid, has been paid, is known. If we put justice back on the table, if we treat it as an option, indeed the option that is always present in a way that distinguishes Arendtian politics or Schmidtian politics or Leninist politics or Weberian politics from non-political life. Then the paramount question, the paramount question 
is always how to reappropriate the cumulative benefits of unjust enrichment without destroying them in the process. Why? Because otherwise, all that bad history will have been a waste. In concluding the paper, then, I want to stress that the price of maintaining the liquidity of asset markets is now a known quantity that was actually paid by the U.S. government. The U.S. government preserved the liquidity of global money markets, preserved the shadow banking system, by swapping 5 to $13 trillion of illiquid private debt for liquid U.S. government debt. The market value of the wealth that was preserved can be estimated by using Thomas Piketty's, or however you pronounce it, uh, you'll hear him this week, metric. It could be five to seven times if we simply take the ratio of GDP to the total credit market debt that can be used by collateral. It can be 13 to 75 times if we look at the extent to which that collateral has been leveraged to produce more collateral. The important point is that the number we're talking about is very large and that for the purpose of justice, there's already plenty to go around if we treat it as an historical option not to disaccumulate, as we might do through the exercise of democracy. My conclusion is that we, in some sense collectively, must develop the theoretical and the activist tools to value the option of justice more highly. Wasn't the restoration of liquidity really a nationalization of the means of financial production that redirected and then reprivatized flows of funds and collateral without first socializing them? If so, then militant social movements should orient themselves around setting a political price for preserving the liquidity of accumulated wealth, and preserving it now in order to make our ability to heighten political volatility more valuable later. I'm thinking here of the 20th century welfare state as the price extracted for not exercising the option of a general strike, a price that could amount within the sphere of production to as much as one-third of GDP. What share of global asset values can be extracted as the price for not exercising the option to bring about a liquidity crisis? We know that the assets are there and that funding justice is a price that capitalism can afford to pay in return for liquidity. Funding justice, then, has to be the number one problem for social movements today, and how these funds should be used would be the subject for another paper. Thank you.